By way of prologue, what I want to say this afternoon concerning the Jesus prayer, let me set before you, as in an icon, a decisive moment from the Old Testament. Moses at the burning bush. The incident recorded in Exodus chapter 3. As Moses stands in the desert before the bush that burns but is not consumed, God says to him two things. And he says these same two things to you and to me and to everyone who seeks to enter into the mystery of living prayer. First God says to Moses, take off your shoes. On the interpretation of the Greek fathers, for example, St. Gregory of Nyssa, shoes made from the skins of dead animals signify the deadness of repetition, boredom, inattentiveness. Take off your shoes, then, means free yourself from what is lifeless, from enslavement to the trivial, the mechanical, the repetitive. Shake off the deadness of boredom. Wake up. Come to yourself. Open your spiritual eyes. Cleanse the doors of your perception. Look and see. Listen. Now there is a special term in orthodox ascetic and mystical theology for this inner experience of waking up. It is the term nepsis, N-E-P-S-I-S, meaning sobriety, watchfulness, alert. Our problem is not primarily that we are deliberately malicious, although most of us are some of the time. <laughs> the problem is that we are bored, and so we grow fragmented and dispersed. We use only a very small part of our spiritual resources. We run in low gear. We live our life with only 5 or 10 percent of our full potential. We are not truly present where we are, gathered in the here and now. What happens next after we have removed our shoes? This brings us to God's uh, second word to Moses, the place on which you are standing is holy ground. What do we experience in ordinary life when we take off our shoes and begin to walk barefoot? We suddenly become sensitive, in a good understanding of that word. We become vulnerable in a positive way. The earth <coughs> under our bare feet comes alive. We feel the grains of dust between, beneath our souls. We feel the texture of the grass. So it is spiritually. Removing our shoes, freeing ourselves from inner deadness, we begin to realize that the world around us is holy. We renew our sense of awe and wonder. We feel the immediate presence of the divine. Each thing, each person becomes a sacrament 
of the Divine Presence, the means of communion with God. Now we can apply all this to our prayer. To pray is to stand like Moses before the burning bush, to take off our shoes, to strip ourselves of deadness, to awaken, to experience all things as fresh and new, to recognize that we are standing on holy ground, to know that God is immediately present before us and within us. Now, at this point, some of you may well be prompted to ask, how? I recall a story told of that great literary figure in Victorian England, Thomas Carlyle. One day, he came back from the Sunday morning service in a bad temper. And he said to his mother, I cannot think why they preach such long sermons. If I were a minister, I would go up into the pulpit and say no more than this. Good people, you know what you ought to do. Now go and do it. <laughs> I, Thomas, his mother said, and uh, would you tell them how? So, how can you and I acquire this living prayer? Prayer not just in words, but inner prayer. Prayer of the deep self. Prayer of the heart. Now the answer offered in the Orthodox tradition is above all to say use the Jesus prayer. Use the short invocation Lord Jesus Christ Son of God have mercy on me. In Greek Kyrie Isu Christe in Slavonic, Gospodi Isuse Christe, Sine Boja Pomiluimia. I'm afraid I can't do it in Romania. <laughs> <laughs> of course, there are many variants to the Jesus prayer. You can say, Have mercy on me, the sinner making it more a penitential prayer. Or you can say, bringing in others, have mercy on us. That's the form that I myself use. Now the Jesus prayer is a way in. A prayer that can enable us to take off our shoes, to wake up, to realize that we're standing on holy ground, to be gathered in God's presence here and now at this very moment. Notice that I say it is a way in, not the only way. Prayer is personal, it's a person-to-person -person conversation, a dialogue between one specific subject, me, and another specific subject, the Holy Trinity. Now, persons are inexhaustibly varied. Each of us is unique. Each of us is unrepeatable. In each of us, there is a special secret, a particular treasure hidden deep in us, not to be found in anyone else. 
That is why in the book of Revelation, the last book in the Bible, in chapter 2, it is said that in the age to come, to each of the redeemed, there will be given a white stone. And on the white stone will be written a new name that nobody knows except the one who receives it. Actually, when I was a child, I had a dream in which I was told what my new name was going to be in the age to come. But I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> <coughs> in one of my favorite books by the Jewish author Martin Buber The Tales of the Hasidim there is a story recounted of Rabbi Zusia Rabbi Zusia said at the last judgment I shall not be asked why were you not Abraham why were you not Moses I shall be asked, why were you not Zeusia? That's what we shall each be asked in the last judgment. Why were you not Callistos? Why were you not Jack? Why didn't I become the unique person that God saw in his mind from all eternity? Why didn't I become my true self? Now, since persons are inexhaustibly varied, and since prayer is personal, it follows that the ways of prayer are also varied. There is no single form of inner prayer that is, without exception, appropriate for everyone everywhere and always each under the guidance of the Holy Spirit under the guidance of our spiritual father or spiritual mother each has to find his or her own way of praying we should always allow for freedom in prayer as Saint Barsanufius of Gaza said, Desert Father of the early 6th century, I do not want you to be under the law, but under grace. So we should not say of the Jesus prayer, it is the only way. Nor even should we say it is the best I would say merely, it has helped many, it has helped me, it may help you. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on us. The center and heart of the Jesus prayer is the holy name Jesus itself. The name given to the Son of God at his human birth in Bethlehem by Mary, his virgin mother, and by his foster father, Joseph. It is a name that means Savior. As the angel says to Joseph in the first chapter of Matthew, you are to name him Jesus for he will save his people from their sins. Now in the Old Testament, the divine name of God, the Tetragrammaton, four letters of God's name, was felt as a source of grace and power. Indeed, in Judaism, such is the reverence for the Holy Name that it is not to be said aloud. 
And this reverence for the name is continued in the New Testament through the holy name of Jesus devils are cast out miracles are brought to pass as is said in a text of the second century the shepherd of Hermas the name of the son of God is great and boundless and it upholds the whole world So, for us Orthodox, the Jesus Prayer, containing as it does this great and boundless holy name, is felt to transmit to us the grace and power of Jesus the Saviour himself. Now, of course, the holy name is not a magic talisman. Nothing, or very little, is gained from a purely mechanical, thoughtless repetition of the name. But if the name of Jesus is invoked with faith and love, then it has sacramental value. It is, the holy name is an outward and visible sign of an inward and spiritual grace. Now I'm sure very many of you use the name of Jesus, use the Jesus prayer regularly and so you will be aware that there are two ways in which the Jesus prayer can be employed. There is first of all the free use. We can say the Jesus prayer once or several times as we go about our regular daily tasks during all the passing moments of the day that might otherwise be wasted. The free use. And then there is what we may call the fixed use when we make the Jesus prayer part of our regular prayer time when in conditions of external quiet we seek solely to pray without being engaged in any other activity you can use the free form of the Jesus prayer not necessarily making it part of your set prayer time of your normal morning and evening prayers so the free use can go without the fixed use though normally they do go together the aim of the free use of the Jesus prayer can be summed up in the phrase, find Christ everywhere. And the aim of the fixed use of the Jesus prayer can be summed up in the words, create silence. So let's look at these two ways of employing the Jesus prayer in our daily life. There are many occasions for the free use. Perhaps we may say the prayer last thing at night before we go to sleep. Though somebody said to me the other day that he found the Jesus prayer so exciting that if he said it before he went to sleep, he wouldn't go to sleep at all. <laughs> so it depends how you are. Certainly, we can say the Jesus Prayer first thing in the morning when we wake up. We can say it when dressing, tidying and cleaning our room, washing up. A time very suitable for the Jesus Prayer is when walking from place to place. I don't drive a car, 
So I like to say the Jesus Prayer when I'm waiting for the bus in Oxford. And I might say that the Oxford bus system leaves many opportunities for prayer. <laughs> If you drive a car, well, you can say the Jesus Prayer when you're sitting in a traffic jam. And I think the city of Washington and the district around it leaves also many opportunities for prayer in its traffic system. I find the Jesus Prayer very useful in committee meetings. <laughs> Also, when talking with others, when counsel, it will sometimes happen that when you talk with another, somehow the conversation doesn't break through to the point of meaning. Neither of you seems able to say what is really on your heart. On such an occasion, I have found it helpful to say the Jesus Prayer two or three times silently in my heart. And I know from experience that this can transform the conversation, can raise it to a new and creative level. The Jesus Prayer is certainly suited for times of physical and mental pain, moments of tension, when other more complex ways of praying wouldn't be possible. And it's very good at moments of temptation, when, for example, you sense feelings of anger rising within you. And that happens we need to act quickly. And that's where the Jesus Prayer comes in. It is simple, direct, flexible, and resilient. Instantly available. It requires no particular knowledge. It requires no special preparation. We can simply begin with the prayer. It's a prayer for all seasons. A prayer especially appropriate for our present age of anxiety. And in fact, I suspect that the Jesus prayer is being used today by more people than ever before. Now you might be a bit surprised by that because we are accustomed to think of our age as an age of secularism, an age of apostasy. But in fact, in the past, the Jesus Prayer in Orthodoxy was used only in certain monasteries and by lay people who belong to the circle of those monasteries. Now it's being used very widely by the Orthodox laity, and not only by Orthodox, but by many non-Orthodox as well. So not just an age of secularism. Now the rationale of this free use of the Jesus prayer is this, it unites prayer time and work time. It turns our work into prayer. It makes the secular sacred. It brings Christ into everything that we do. It enables us to find Christ everywhere. I think here of the poem by the English writer of the 17th century, George Herbert, poem The Elixir, which in childhood 
I used to sing as a hymn. Teach me, my God and King, in all things thee to see, and what I do in anything, to do it as for thee. In all things thee to see. That's the purpose of the Jesus prayer. In the words of Father Alexander Schmemann, the end of his wonderful book, For the Life of the World, a Christian is the one who, wherever he or she looks, sees everywhere Christ and rejoices in Him. There is an unwritten saying of our Lord that illustrates this. A saying not to be found in the canonical Gospels, but which circulated among the Christians in the early times. Lift the stone and you will find me. Cut the wood in two and there am I. Now, St. Paul says, 1 Thessalonians 5.17, Pray without ceasing. I don't think the Apostle meant say prayers all the time. This is scarcely possible. We've got to sleep sometimes. Though actually if you say the Jesus prayer frequently you may find yourself saying it in your dreams while you are asleep. But I don't think it is desirable to say prayers all the time. I doubt if that was the intention of St. Paul. When we are engaged on a particularly difficult task that demands our total attention, it is perhaps not wise to try and break off and keep saying prayers. For example, suppose you are a surgeon performing a highly delicate operation where it is a matter of life and death, where the smallest error will be fatal. Would it be wise for the surgeon as he was busy with the operation, probing away, suddenly to keep stopping, saying, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God. Surely it will be better for him to concentrate his entire attention on the task that he is performing. But, very possibly the surgeon might wish to say the Jesus prayer before he begins the operation. And then he might find, such is the effect of the Jesus prayer, we use it frequently, that even while he was totally gathered in the task of the operation, yet nonetheless, on a deep level, of himself, the spirit of prayer would continue. It's not a good thing to try and do two things at once. Probably you will do neither of them very well. St. James in his epistle says, don't be double-minded. The other day when I was sitting in the dentist's thinking about what was going to happen shortly. Uh, I picked up a magazine I don't usually study, the Reader's Digest, and I don't say anything against it. I opened it, and I found there a very useful apothegma, which said the people who get things done are the people who do one thing at a time. And I thought, how very true. And then I thought, how difficult 
to do one thing at a time, be totally gathered in one immediate task, is not easy. It requires a high level of sanctity even. So yes, do one thing at a time and don't try then to say the Jesus Prayer if you are writing a particularly difficult letter to your lawyer or <laughs> to your lodger who hasn't paid the rent. Um, yes, think totally about what you are doing. But the spirit of prayer may nonetheless continue without dividing you, without making you double-minded. The frequent use of the Jesus prayer then will flow over into the times when we are not actually saying the prayer. St. Gregory of Nyssa says, prayer is a sense of presence. And it is possible to have a continual sense of presence. That is what I think St. Paul meant by pray without ceasing. Not say prayers continu continually, but preserve deep within yourself an unceasing awareness of God. Now, I've been speaking of the free use of the Jesus Prayer. Let me now say a few words about the fixed use, as I have termed it. Normally, the Jesus Prayer is said alone, not in groups. In monasteries, the appointed time for the Jesus Prayer is after the last service of the day, Compline, Povicieri, in your cell before you go to sleep. And also early in the morning before the first service of the day, before the midnight office, again alone in your cell. But there are some places where the Jesus prayer is said not alone, but in groups. For example, the Orthodox monastery in Britain of St. John the Baptist at Tollis and Knights in Essex, founded by Father Sofroni, the disciple of St. Silwan. There, during the weekdays, they recite the Jesus prayer together in church two hours in the morning two hours in the evening I thought when I first went to stay there two hours this is going to be a long time how will it pass but when I actually was with them saying the Jesus prayer I was amazed how quickly the time went and when the moment came for the prayer to end, I thought we've only been here for 20 minutes, but no, it was two hours. At the monastery, they don't all say it aloud together, which is not a good idea. If you all say it together, it will get louder and louder, and you won't have the spirit of Hesekia, of stillness. But one person says the prayer a hundred times aloud and the rest follow in their hearts. And I know of several parishes that have sessions of the Jesus Prayer in that way and clearly it does help many people. But normally, yes, the Jesus Prayer is a prayer said alone. It is said seated the Byzantine sources suggest that you should sit on a low stool about 10 inches high in a crouching position. If you try that, you'll find very soon it becomes acutely uncomfortable. <laughs> so I would advise people who are starting the Jesus Prayer to sit on an ordinary chair with a back, upright, 
without your legs crossed, of course, because we're going to pray with legs crossed. But in a position where your body is comfortable and you're not particularly conscious of it. The prayer would normally be said, not chanted, not as we said outwardly with your voice, but it would still be articulated distinctly inwardly. And the speed can vary. Each person can find the speed that suits them best. I would say it somewhat as follows. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on us. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on us. The Greeks often say it quicker than that, and the Russians often say it slower. So you can find your own rhythm. Usually the Jesus prayer is said with the eyes closed. Aha, you will say, we may foresee an obvious consequence. <laughs> we will soon drop off to sleep. If you find yourself getting sleepy, stand up, make the sign of the cross, make a prostration after each prayer, pour it down to the ground, standing up again. But if you do that 10 or 20 times, that may help to wake you up. <laughs> The question of sleeping has always been a problem for me, not just in the afternoons, as now, so most of you are doing quite well, um, <laughs> but I fall asleep in all situations. Once I was unwise enough to be giving a talk sitting down, and I fell asleep in my own talk. <laughs> I could hear a voice droning on <laughs> and suddenly I realized with a shock it was my own voice and I had no idea what I was saying. <coughs> so, yes, if I see people with their eyes closed when I'm talking, I think, well, they're praying. <laughs> You can link the Jesus prayer with the rhythm of the breathing. There are special techniques for doing this, but we are recommended not really to try the breathing techniques unless we have personal guidance from an experienced spiritual father. The books don't describe the breathing techniques in any great detail. So if you look at volume four of the English Philokalia, you will find a certain amount of material about that. The breathing, however, is a highly delicate thing, and if you interfere with it, you may have startling consequences. <laughs> so be careful. A friend of mine who was using the breathing technique under guidance from a spiritual father found one day that he had forgotten how to breathe. He did not know how he was going to take the next breath. And he felt a moment of total panic. I shall be suffocated. And then to his immense relief he found that he could breathe again, but he stopped using the breathing exercises after that. So they come with a health warning. <laughs> but without any danger of ulterior consequences, you can use to help you with the Jesus prayer a prayer rope. What? The Greeks call konvoskilion, what the Russians call vervitsa, or chotki. It's the orthodox equivalent 
to the Roman Catholic Rosary, but it's used not for prayer to the <coughs> Mother of God, but for prayer to Jesus. It can be made of beads, but it's more commonly made of knotted wool or cord, so it is silent in use, though this is my normal prayer rope. It has a hundred knots on it, and you will say one Jesus prayer on each knot. But I have a rather smaller prayer rope for use at committee meetings. <laughs> <laughs> The purpose of the prayer rope is not to measure the number of times you're saying the Jesus prayer, because mere quantity doesn't have any special significance. But if you give your hands something to do while you are praying, it's a fact of experience that this will help you to maintain a regular rhythm of prayer so that it flows gently and easily and it will prevent you from fidgeting. <clears throat> yes, the Jesus prayer should be said gently, of course with attention, but not with excessive strained emphasis. Don't say, Lord Jesus. Christ. If you pray like that, you will very soon get tired. <laughs> but just let the prayer flow gently. The spiritual teachers tell us, let it be like a gently flowing stream. In Greek and Slavonic, the Jesus prayer has a distinct rhythm. Less obviously so in English. The aim is, let it flow gently. To those who are not so familiar with the Jesus Prayer, I suggest that initially it's quite sufficient to say it 10 or 15 minutes at a time, not longer. But as you grow accustomed to it, you can choose to say it a greater length. Incidentally, while I'm on the subject of the prayer rope, this should be carefully distinguished from worry beads, <laughs> what you see the Greeks playing with as they sit around. The name for worry beads in Greek is convologion, and the name for a prayer rope is Converskinio. A friend of mine, a rather idealistic English convert to orthodoxy, went for the first time to Greece, and he returned with great enthusiasm, not understanding the difference between a prayer rope and one in me. Greece, he said, is a wonderful country. The people are so spiritual. Why, the men are sitting in cafes, smoking, drinking ouzo, playing cards, but all the time they're saying the Jesus. <laughs> now, the inner aim of the Jesus prayer, as I've said, is to create silence. In the words of Soren Kierkegaard, if I were a doctor and were asked for my advice, I should reply, create silence. Surely our contemporary world is greatly in need of such a doctor. The Roman Catholic spiritual guide, Baron Friedrich von Hugel, says, man is what he does with his silence. Silence is an essential component in our human personhood. Without silence, we are not genuinely human. And the Jesus Prayer precisely is a way of entry 
into silence, into inner stillness, silence of the heart. But what do we mean by silence? Is it merely something outward, an absence of noise? Is it basically negative, a pause between words? Or is true silence rather something inward and positive? Not an absence, but a presence. Not a void, an emptiness, but fullness. Surely, in the deep and true sense, silence is awareness of another. Silence is a presence. At the heart of it is God. As it says in the Psalms, Be still and know that I am God. The psalmist doesn't just say, be still, but he says, know that God is here. Stillness, silence, is God awareness. So true silence, understood in this positive sense, signifies not isolation, but relationship. Silence means receptivity openness, encounter. Silence goes hand in hand with love. It is a losing and finding of oneself in the other through love. Silence is being with in an alert, attentive manner. Take off your shoes. Silence is listening waiting on God, simple gazing. In many Byzantine churches, when you look up at the apse at the east end, you will see in the hemisphere a figure of the Mother of God with her hands raised towards heaven in prayer, waiting on the Holy Spirit, the Mother of God, Oran, or in Greek, platitera. And that expresses exactly the attitude that we are hoping to acquire through the Jesus prayer. Waiting on God, listening, simple gazing. When I was about 10 years old, I listened to a sermon about prayer in the village church where we went. And the preacher told a story about an old man who every day would spend a long time in church. What are you doing there? His friends asked him. And he replied, I'm praying. Praying, they said. You must have a great many things to ask God for. And with some warmth of feeling, the old man replied, I'm not asking God for anything. Well, they said, what are you doing then? And he replied, I sit and look at God, and God sits and looks at me. When I was ten years old, I thought that was a very good description of prayer. And I still think so now. <coughs> So the Jesus prayer, understood in this way, is a prayer in words. But because the words are very simple, it's a prayer that leads to silence. It is supremely a prayer of listening, a prayer of simple gazing, a contemplative prayer. Now a difficulty that we, all of us, encounter when praying is, how can I stop talking and start to listen? When I was a student many years ago, my favorite radio program was The Goon Show, <laughs> a comedy show 
with a particularly surreal and dotty sense of humour. I don't suppose many of you will remember the Golden Show, but I do. <laughs> and I remember one occasion when the telephone goes and one of the characters, Harry Seacombe, lifts the receiver and he says, Hello! Hello! Who's speaking? I can't hear you. Hello! Who's speaking? And the voice the other end says, You are speaking. <laughs> says, I thought the voice sounded familiar. <laughs> and he puts the receiver down. <laughs> now, might that not be taken as a parable of what all too often we experience when we pray? <laughs> we hear the sound of our own voice. What is much more difficult for us is to hear the wordless voice at the other end of the spiritual telephone wire. Now, the Jesus prayer is one possible way, as I said, not the only way, to listen, to hear this voice at the other end of the telephone wire, the Oetic telephone wire, to stop talking and to start listening. It's not much use to say to ourselves, stop thinking. You can't turn off the endless sequence of images and thoughts just by a simple effort of will. You can't turn off the inner television set just by pressing a button. But what you can do is to give to your ever active mind a task that is very simple. A task that will fulfill its need for activity. A task of a prayer in words, but in and through the very simple, repeated words of the Jesus prayer, you will find the way into silence. We speak, but at the same time, we listen. Now, before ending, let's consider an objection often made against the Jesus prayer and against other forms of contemplative prayer. We live in a world of anguish and suffering, a world of hunger, poverty, warfare, a world full of refugees, a world full of lonely people. What about our social responsibility? What about our concern for the suffering of those around us? Are we not turning our backs on this when we pray in solitude with our eyes closed, repeating the words, have mercy on me? Isn't this somehow selfish, inward-looking, world-denying? Let me answer with two short sentences. The first is from that great saint of 19th century Russia, Seraphim of Sarov. Acquire inner peace and thousands around you will find salvation. Acquire inner peace and thousands around you will find salvation. And my second word is from the one-time uh, Secretary of the United Nations, Dag Hammarskjöld, in his remarkable book of meditations called Markings. <coughs> he says, understand through the stillness, act out of the stillness, conquer in the stillness. Understand through the stillness, act out of the stillness, conquer in the stillness. 
Now the aim of the Jesus prayer exactly is to acquire inner peace. But this is not selfish, for it makes us by God's grace and mercy an instrument of peace to others. Because we have prayed alone, as our Lord says in the Sermon on the Mount, with the door shut in secret, it may be for no more than 10 or 15 minutes each day. Then throughout all the other minutes and hours of the day, we shall be available to others, open to their concerns, loving, Christ-like, in a way that would otherwise be impossible. Then secondly, the aim of the Jesus prayer is exactly to help us to understand in the stillness so that we can then act out of the stillness. St. Ignatius of Antioch, early in the second century, uses the striking phrase, Jesus Christ the word that came out of stillness. Because Christ's words came out of stillness, because Christ's actions came out of stillness, they were words of fire and healing, they were acts of power and transfiguration. All too often, our words and actions are superficial and ineffective because they do not come out of stillness. But if only they had their source in prayer, living inner prayer, then our words and actions could bear fruit in ways far beyond anything that we imagine possible. Act out of the stillness. Jesus' prayer is a prayer of stillness, a contemplative prayer, but it's a prayer that enables us to combine contemplation and action. It's a prayer that makes our contemplation active and our action contemplative. Thank you. Some refreshments for everybody, but before we kind of let you...